In Eritrea, there is no war, there is no famine. Yet, every month, up to 5,000 people flee the small Horn of Africa country. Can we ask you a few questions? No. Can we ask you a few questions for French television? Oh. Can we ask you a few questions? For the Haina. For French television? No. I'm not that interested in politics. So, sorry. In Eritrea, people are reluctant to talk about the government. This secretive nation is notorious for its poor human rights record. There's no personality cult here, but the country's had the same president, Isaiah Safwerki, since its independence in 1993. And there's only one political party. People in the Eritrean government live normal lives. They don't need uh, guards, they don't need uh, armed soldiers to protect them. Uh, this is a government that is very close to the people. So this is a government that came out of, of the population itself. For this documentary, we interviewed several opponents of the regime who all live in exile. There was the outbreak of the Eritrean Revolution in September 1961 all the way to 1991. Here, all Eritreans supported EBLF as a vehicle for realization of the aspiration of independence. There is a question that the Eritreans ask right now. 25 years of independence, of liberation, what, what did we gain? The country's leaders were members of a Marxist guerrilla movement. It fought for 30 years for Eritrea to gain its independence from Ethiopia in 1991. Access to health and education is free. There are hardly any private firms. Eritrea's five million inhabitants often have to queue, especially in banks, which all belong to the state. We don't have that type of uh, machine to withdraw money. You know, we have to depend on this thing. Today we have uh, many people who are waiting to withdraw money, so sometimes it may take uh, half an hour and some other times it may take longer. The government refuses to publish economic statistics, arguing that they would be used against it by its enemies. Eritrea is one of the poorest countries in the world. The state hopes that one day tourists will flock here to admire, among other things, Asmara's Art Deco Italian architecture. But for that to happen, it knows it must first change the country's image. One of the tasks of the Ministry of Information is to improve Eritrea's reputation. What you need only, you can make it right. What you want, you need it, yes. you make a sign, and we can prepare for you only. It's rare for Western journalists to obtain visas. We are allowed to stay for only a few days. Our program is busy. We will visit Asmara, the small town of Agordat, and the port of Masawa. Our guides work for the Ministry of Information. We start by a swift tour of the country's only TV station. Currently, we have only one television. That's the government-owned Airy TV. Well, why is there only one? We have independent information, but we don't have independent TV channel. We have only the government-owned Airy TV. And do you feel free as a journalist to say anything you want from this Yes, channel? I'm always free. I'm free to move, I'm free to speak, I'm free to write. Sixty thousand people lost their lives during the independence struggle. In 1991, when Eritrea became a nation, Ethiopia lost all access to the sea. Today, Ethiopia still occupies Eritrean territory that it took during a bloody two-year border dispute that ended in May 2000.
All these are the remnants of the war, of the Ethiopian army, vehicles, tanks, and other things. So they collect it here for some, for exhibit, for uh, museums. During the struggle, Emmanuel, our guide from the ministry, was on the front line. He can remember all the past things, because to gain this one, we pay a lot of, we pay life of our friends, brothers and sisters. So, and we get the independence and we have to be, work very hard to build the country for the future. Like Emmanuel, thousands fought for the EPLF, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, which later became the country's only political party. For this, we get freedom. We get freedom from Ethiopians. We are happy. We are proud by this, by this, by this. Uh, yes, we are proud. Emmanuel leaves us with Yishak, who will be our interpreter today. <coughs> Yishak takes us round Medabar Market, where everything is recycled. Self-sufficiency is the government's favourite slogan. It's vital in a country where the average wage is around 30 euros a month. <laughs> How are you? I'll see you tonight. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, his father's property, so, so he, he, he's helping his father after school. <laughs> Many young Eritreans choose to flee the country. Several thousand leave every month, according to the United Nations. In Eritrea, it's a taboo subject. Why are young people fleeing this country? I don't know. Do people really run away? I haven't seen any, I stay here. Do you support those who are leaving? That's their choice. Their choice. In recent years, pictures like these of Eritreans risking their lives to reach Europe have sadly become all too common. They are fleeing poverty, a one-party regime, and above all, a badly paid indefinite national service, obligatory for all men and women. People are escaping because they are stifled. You know, they can't breathe anymore because, you know, without the freedom to, to work, the freedom to have a family, the freedom to travel, the freedom to get education. What life do you have? The young people see that they can't do any activity as long as that national service obligation exists. It's endless. There is no legal way of going out of the national service. Some people can go out earlier, but there is no way of knowing if you can go out of the national service and start your life. The information minister, who's very close to President Isaias, strongly disagrees. We thought we'll show you one film on migration because uh, migration is a topical issue in the West. Uh, press coverage is mostly sensational. It does not uh, try to explore the underlying causes. Maybe this will, will give you a different perspective. Eritrea's national service program has drawn much attention and criticism by the international media as the primary cause of emigration. 
the more extreme journalists and NGOs have even gone as far as calling the program slavery. The 20-minute film makes two main statements. Firstly, it says that people leave Eritrea only for economic reasons, not because they are persecuted. Secondly, it says the West is attracting Eritreans because it grants them asylum too easily. The European Union admits that nowadays many migrants from other countries claim to be Eritreans. The ministry's film also says the goal of national service is to protect the country. If war breaks out, if Turkey attacks tomorrow, what do you do? So everybody in the national service has an obligation and you will be recalled. But you do civilian job. So everybody is doing civilian job. So when we talk about national service, we're not talking about people who are in the army. We're talking about some of them are in the army, yes, but the majority of them are doing civilian jobs. But are you trying to limit it or what is the objective? The question we ask is, why do you ask us to make um, not effort, but, but, but uh, to take solutions that, will, uh, that threaten our existence when you also have levers and you're not using them. And Ethiopia continues to uh, rattle the saber, to, to, to make uh, threats of war against Eritrea. It continues to occupy our land. This is against international law. It's against uh, the, 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 the Algiers uh, Peace Treaty, which was guaranteed by the Security Council. Young Eritreans who have not fled stay connected to the diaspora through the internet. They use Wi-Fi outside and inside internet cafes. But the network is desperately slow. For once, we can film without our minders. These young girls tell us what they think about Ethiopians. We have so much similarities and stuff. I like we as a young, um, the youngest people in Eritrea have nothing against Ethiopians. I, so does the Ethiopians. So we just all want peace, and uh, we just want peace. Not, uh, that's all. National service can be carried out in the army, but most of the time it means working as a secretary or in a shop. We accept that we have to do something for our country and. We're going to get something some, back to yeah, us. Some reward back to us for defending our and country. And it's all f for good, yeah. so it's good for us. But when we don't say we're filming, Eritreans, like our taxi driver that evening, deliver a damning verdict on the national service. How many years do you stay as a military? A military? How many years? Unknown time. That's the problem. That's why many Eritreans go to another country for for, uh, for Italy somewhere. I don't want the national service because I'm ten years old in national service, not finish it. Huh? I'm hide <laughs> huh? from police. I'm working in the night time in taxi. In the daytime in my home sleep. So why don't you try and leave Eritrea? Because the border is very, by, by the soldier is some problem. Because when I was go out from Sudan or Ethiopia, I need some money. Because of money problem. $5,000 to enter to Sudan. $3,000 to Ethiopia. <laughs> Today, our interpreter is Mela. She regularly writes articles for the state newspaper, the only one in the country. Mela grew up in Switzerland and is a staunch defender of the government. In Agodat and in the rest of Eritrea, you have several different ethnic groups living together. Muslims and Christians living and working together. People have friends from other ethnic groups. That's how Eritrea is. Eritrea doesn't want her vision, her culture, her way of seeing things to be imposed by the outside world. Each country has its own characteristics. 
Abdallah owns a clothes shop in this small town of Agordat in central Eritrea. He also praises the government. We have economic problems, but the country is very, very safe. It's true the country does have a low crime rate. The regime's detractors say this is also because Eritreans fear the authorities. We are stopped at a checkpoint. Foreigners in Eritrea cannot leave the capital without a travel permit. With the problems we've had along our border, we don't want anyone going just anywhere. That's also why this travel permit exists. The government is saying that Eritrea is in danger. Eritrea is under threat of a massive invasion by Ethiopia. What the Ethiopians are saying that we are not interested in any military action against Eritrea. Well, I think both countries are benefiting of the situation which is existing now. The Eritrean government is trying to invest this situation to stay in power. The Ethiopians would like to see Eritrea suffer. By the roadside outside Asmara, we chance upon a scene that has not been prepared by our minders from the ministry. Be careful. Do you have a crowbar? No, push with your hands. Come on, push. Boss, they're asking what we're doing here. Hello, how are you? This is a document from the Information Ministry. There are guests from France. They're shooting a documentary to see what the government's policies are. It's a voluntary service, they're not paid. The roads belong to the people. It's their decision to be here. But the rock breakers tell us another story. Who is paying you? La, la, la. We haven't any more money. We haven't any more money. These people, nasty. We are soldiers. All of us. This all of us uh, military service. All of us. I explained to them we are doing our national service. Be brave, don't worry, say what you have to say. I told them our supervisor is over there and they can talk to him. Just say that, no more, you've been brave. He asked me how long we work for. I said three, four hours a day. There's no limit. We're not paid. They don't give us anything. It's the military service. Just as we are about to leave, the old worker has a request. I want something. I'm a poor man. I haven't any man to help me. I can write, I can read. Please help me with that one. Back in Asmara, we have an appointment with one of the country's most influential men, Yemani Gebriab. He's head of political affairs in the ruling party. We ask him why the regime became authoritarian after 2001. That year, several political leaders were imprisoned after they asked the president to make the country more democratic. Where are they? Are they still alive? As Eritreans, we have decided to handle this issue of this 15 because of their role 
uh, during the war and their previous role as a national uh, issue. And we have decided to go uh, at it in a very different way. Uh, as I said, these are very people who have committed very serious offenses and serious crimes, but we wanted to deal with it in a way that would help us heal the wounds in this society and maintain our unity. According to Amnesty International, there are currently around 10,000 political prisoners in the country. When a prisoner arrives, he's in chains, he's blindfolded. When his family knows where he is, they will move him. He can go from prison to prison. Most of them are underground. There are some all over the country. When he arrives, a prisoner asks what crime he's committed. He's told that it's already written down. He just has to sign. He's not told what he's guilty of. When you sign, even though you've done nothing, well, you recognize your guilt. But if you don't sign, you spend your life in prison. Those who interrogate prisoners come from the outside. They are not prison workers. During the interrogation, you hear people yelling, being tortured. And the next day, you see the prisoners. You see bruises and blood on their legs, on their ankles, all over their bodies. And you know they've been interrogated. Hello. How beautiful you? Well, you warned that we would come here. Well, then. This construction site is jointly managed by Italian company Piccini and the Eritrean state. In more or less 15, uh, 15 people uh, Italian people and uh, Romania people. And there is another uh, 150, more or less, people, uh, the local people, Eritrean people that work here. The walls of houses are prepared in special molds. Italian group Piccini says the aim here is the transfer of skills and technology. This factory is the Eritrean factory. So, in the future, it is necessary that work here always the Eritrean people. The expatriate teach to the Eritrean people all work in the factory. This is too much important. Most of the employees here are no ordinary workers. The people that work here, uh, there is more or less 70% soldier and 30% the civil people. We express our surprise at seeing soldiers working in a factory. So, oh, happy. All of the people is soldier. Today we leave Asmara, which lies 2,400 meters above sea level, and head for the port of Masawa, a two-hour drive down a windy road. The views are stunning and will surely attract droves of tourists one day. For three centuries, Masawa was part of the Ottoman Empire but during the independence struggle against Ethiopia, much of it was destroyed. Yeah. 
this was a barn. The front was from this side. The shelling was hit it badly. That's when uh, this city, Masawa, was liberated. The Ethiopians, they can't get to gain the victory, so they lose the, uh, so they are getting angry, I don't know. They can bomb it to the civilians, not to the military. It's a sleepy town. Residents tell us they only see one big cargo ship every 20 days. Because of the tensions, Ethiopia and its 87 million inhabitants only uses Djibouti to trade goods. Much like the port, Masawa's hotels are usually empty. Primo Giovanni is half Italian, half Eritrean. He owns the Grand Hotel Dalak. Giovanni supports the government and gets irritated when we ask him what he thinks of the country's youth exodus. Bafankulo speak with these people. I don't like these people. Why you go with? Because everybody in morning and evening, they have eat here. Why you go with here? Why? Why? Before people, they go in Glandesi by boat, by ship, this way. How are you going to Libya, Libya, Lampedusa, this one? These crazy people. Come on, sure. See them in swimming pool, very big swimming pool make it. No one people. Today's holiday, no? No, no people, little, little tourists. Look the sun. Primo Giovanni may wait for tourists to arrive, but many other Eritreans prefer to flee a young nation where national service seems to have no end. Our report by Romeo Longlois and Nicola Germain on life in Eritrea. See it again on our website, francefancat.com. This is Reporters Plus. Thanks for watching. Stay with us.